Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to, to everybody. I am Dr. Seher Rashid, resident of hematology at Afghan University Hospital. I'm very pleased to moderate today's session for paramedics and lab technologists. It's a great opportunity to be a part of PSH HemeCon 2021. I hope that everyone is uh, enjoying the ongoing sessions and uh, has learned a lot. And I also hope that today's session is going to be equally interesting and informative. So for today's session, we are going to have a total of seven talks. We also have two esteemed panelists, including Dr. Bushra Muiz, consultant hematologist. Uh, she is currently working as professor of uh, uh, hematology and uh, service line chief of uh, Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine at Ahan University Hospital. Uh, she did her uh, MBBS from Dow Medical College, FCPS from Yakut National Hospital, and FRCP from Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh. She has numerous publications in national and international peer-reviewed medical journals and has uh, attended multiple national and international conferences. Thank you so much, Dr. Busha, for being a part of uh, this panel. Our next panelist is Dr. Shabni Hussain. She is currently working as medical director at Fatmeed Hospital. She did her FCPS in hematology from Aachen University Hospital. She has special interest in practicing management of hemoglobinopathies, inherited bleeding disorders, and transfusion medicine. Thank you so much, Dr. Shabniz, for being a part of uh, today's panel. Uh, now, before starting uh, with the, today's presentations and talks, let me uh, tell the uh, virtual attendees that if you have any questions, you can ask us by uh, leaving your question uh, on the Ask a Question tab on the virtual uh, environment, or you can ask the question directly on the number given below in the ticker. Please write your question, your introduction, and also to whom you want to ask the question. And for the free paper participants, I would like to tell them that each one of you is going to get a total of 10 minutes. So please try to uh, complete your presentation in the uh, given time. So to begin with the talk, I would like to invite our first participant, Dr. Zainab Akram. She is a PhD in uh, biochemistry and molecular biology. She's currently working as a research officer at Armed Forces Bone Marrow Transplant Center. Uh, her past experience includes working at National Institute of Health USA, King's College London, and also Flow Cytometry Institute at Switzerland. Her special interest is in genetics of hematological disorders and establishing criteria for diagnosis and prognosis of patients based on their molecular biology. So she will be presenting her paper on telomere length measurement. So please welcome Dr. Zainab Akram. Akmar Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Zainab Akram from Armed Forces Bone Marrow Transplant Center. And I'll be talking about telomere length measurement protocols, their advantages, disadvantages, and the importance of measuring and knowing telomere length of different individuals at specific time intervals. As we all know that telomeres are nucleoprotein structures that consist of a repetitive unit of TTA triple G and are located at the ends of the chromosome. The foremost important function of telomere is maintaining chromosomal stability as it prevents the chromosome from being identified as damaged and therefore stops their degradation and end-to-end -end fusion. In all normal somatic cells, telomere length decreases with each cell division, which has to be stopped from extreme shortening to maintain the normal functioning of cells. This balance is kept by a riboenzyme known as telomerase, but this can be done up to a certain limit. Still, the telomere shortens due to the incomplete replication of lagging strand, the phenomenon known as end replication problem. The telomere shortening has detrimental effects, and some of the reasons of these shortening can be as follows. As we have seen previously in the slide, the telomere contains high guanine content, which makes it highly susceptible to the oxidation of oxidative stress. This causes damage which is not easily repairable. And may result in telomere dysfunction. Secondly, hydroxyl radical attacks result in the accumulation of single-stranded breaks that lead to accelerated telomere shortening or even complete loss in some cases. Metabolism, radiations, carcinogens, compounds, and other exogenous sources may create ROS. There are reactive oxygen species which have irreparable DNA legions. They can be mutagenic and cytotoxic and cause genetic instability 
cell proliferation problems, and even cell death. One important point worth mentioning here is that living organisms do possess DNA repair mechanism to repair DNA damage, but telomeric DNA is less capable of this repair, resulting in accelerated telomere attrition during cell cycle and replicative senescence. Telomeres seem to be very sensitive for both single-stranded breaks and double-stranded breaks. Here's a pictorial representation of all the factors that we just explained. Now we have to see the effects of abnormal telomere length on the life of cell and human being. Critical short telomeres induce cellular senescence or even the definitive inability of cells to divide. Telomere attrition in stem cells result in the depletion of their tissues and cell renewability. In both cases, telomere shortening can lead to different age-related pathology. A wide range of studies have shown that dysfunctional telomere length in biological human sample is usually related to increased risk of degenerative diseases of aging diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, dementia, cognitive impairment, and even cancers. Telomeres are also related to several other human diseases in which some mutations of TERC are reported, such as dyskeratosis congenita, several hereditary symptoms of bone marrow failure, and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Shortened telomeres are also seen in patients of aplastic anemia. And some studies even suggest that baseline telomere length is associated with late events of hematological relapse in aplastic anemia patients treated with immunosuppressant therapy. Thus, understanding the benefits and drawbacks of telomere length measurement is very important. Because short telomeres, meaning anything under the average TL, limits long-term stem cell division essential for tissue renewal. So we need to learn and apply robust and reproducible TL measurement methods that may predict onset of certain genetic or age-related pathology. The first protocol that we are about to study is STELA, which stands for Single Telomere Length Analysis, and it is based on ligation method, targeting the amplification of telomeric DNA from single chromosomal end through the use of primers that are specific to the subtelomeric sequence of that chromosome. But as this already suggests the difficulty of the situation, that is, the subtelomeric regions of the chromosomes are quite complex and lack specificity. Thus, primer designing for each and all chromosomes is not possible. The merits of Stella include that it allows direction of critically short telomeres, no specialized equipment is needed, and does not require viable cell. The demerits include that it provides information for a small subset of chromosomes does not provide mean telomere data and cannot detect long telomeres and is labor intensive. The second method that we are about to study is qPCR method. In this method, PCR amplification of DNA sequence of interest is done using specifically telomere sequence design primers with which fluorophore or a probe is attached. After each cycle, the amount of emitted fluorescence is measured, allowing the quantity of the starting material to be inferred. Point of mention is that a single copy gene is also amplified alongside during this protocol to compare the amount of telomere. For analysis, the telomere and single copy gene ratio is calculated to give telomere length. The following merits make this method the most commonly used one to measure telomere length across the globe. It allows detection in a very small amount of DNA. It is low cost, less labor intensive, and thus most commonly used method. The demerits are that it has high intra and inter-sample variability. The primer design can cross-link, giving rise to extra results, and different PCR mixes show different results. Southern blotting is a modified version of telomere restriction fragment method, TRF method, that was the original technique developed to measure telomere length. Therefore, it was also called as gold standard. In this protocol, DNA is exhaustively digested with cocktail of cutting restriction enzymes. These enzymes do not have any recognition sites within the telomeric or subtelomeric region. Thus, the telomeric DNA is not cut and remains intact. Telomeres from all the chromosomes are then resolved based on the size or the subtelomeric and telomeric region. And by southern blotting with a probe specific to the telomeric DNA. Advantages and disadvantages of this include that it requires a high amount of DNA and it is quite labor intensive. Simplicity and low price reagents are the merits of this method. 
The uncontested champion among all the methods remains FISH, which stands for fluorescence in pseudo hybridization. This is a molecular cytogenetic method that can be employed to obtain information from metaphase or interphase cells. This method is based on hybridization of telomeric DNA of fixed cells with a fluorescently labeled probe with sequence complementary to the repeated unit of the telomeric DNA. The probe is labeled with a dye, which upon excitation emits fluorescent signals. The demerits of uh, FISH include that it requires a designated specialized equipment, extensive training, requires fresh blood, and the merits include high resolution and can detect length in limited number of cells. Another technique that is being used nowadays is whole genome sequence-based technique. WGS-based telomere length measurement supplies reliable sequence reads from telomeres. However, their standard alignment to the reference sequence provides limited information on the region of origin due to the repetitive nature of telomeric regions. The chief challenge for using next generation sequence to measure telomere length is the need for bioinformatics expertise and softwares to decipher massive datasets. Important factors that should be considered when comparing WGS based telomere measurement techniques are tool accessibility, ease of tool use, the time required to analyze one sample, and multi-threading ability. Now, there are some suggestions based on literature reported that can be used to maintain the telomere length. A proper diet providing a proper intake of antioxidants and reduction of inflammation levels. Iron is a very important trace element for maintaining a metabolic homeostasis and genome stability. There, nevertheless, it is required in a very relatively narrow range. Otherwise, iron becomes a high potential generator of ROS. High levels of plasma, vitamin D are associated with long telomeres. Folate is important and lifetime practices of exercise. Mild help slower. In 2016, I performed sudden blotting on aplastic anemia patients from AFBMTC. This test was done at National Institute of Health USA. This table shows that telomere length was measured in 10 patients with TERT and TERP mutations. The highlighted patients are the ones that have low telomere length as compared to the average ones. The telomere length of these patients was again compared to their age, ages and it is represented in this graph. Uh, this article was published uh, from this work and uh, it can be studied to understand the results in detail. Nowadays, we have established telomere length measurement protocol for research purposes as AFPMTC through qPCR method using Cawthon methodology. We are comparing telomere length of aplastic anemia patients with age-matched healthy control samples. Our initial data is quite promising, and we intend to extend this facility for inherited bone marrow failure syndromes and other telomeropathies. Now, there is a prayer from me to you. Live longer telomerically speaking. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zeram, uh, for your very informative presentation on uh, telomere length measurement, its uses, and also different methodologies, and uh, also sharing your ongoing work as well. Uh, this is very informative. Thank you. Now, our next speaker is going to be, doc, uh, is going to be Anam Parveen. Uh, she is a medical lab technologist from Children's Hospital Lahore. She has worked in pathology department and choose hematology and transfusion medicine for her research and uh, for her further work. So she will be presenting her paper on ABO discrepancy in lymphoma and solid organ tumor. Over to you, uh, Anna Parveen. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Anna Parveen from Lahore. And today's my topic is AB discrepancy in lymphoma and solid organ tumor patients. Background AB blood group discrepancies are frequently encountered in patients of lymphoma and solid organ tumors that results in discrepant results of forward and reverse blood grouping. The objective of my study is to determine the frequency of ABO discrepancies in patients of lymphoma and solid organ tumor and to further categorize these discrepancies as they are in discrepancy 1, 2, 3, and 4 types. Mm -hmm. This observational study was conducted at the Hematology and Transfusion Medicine Department, the Children's Hospital and ICS Lahore from October 2019 to January 2020. 
A total of one of five samples were analyzed from patients of lymphoma and solid organ tumor. Their chemotherapy status was also noticed. For forward and reverse blood grouping was performed by tube method following standard operation procedures. Auto control was also run along. A total of 105 samples were analyzed. Among them, they are further categorized according to the base of ages. As on group one, 30, uh, uh, from age one to five, they, I, uh, I received 30 samples from these uh, group age one to five. And from group two, six, uh, age of six years to 10 years, I received 45 samples. And in group three, that is from age 11 to 15 years, I have received 30 samples. In them, they were uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, among 105 samples, uh, 78 two uh, were females and 33 were males. Among these samples of 105, I received uh, I uh, detected three blood group discrepancies. And these were two from group one type and uh, one from group one, uh, two type. This is a graphical representation of frequency of stages of diseases among the patients. As I received the samples from the patients that were all on chemotherapy, and they are the between and the discrepancies were found in these uh, and the discrepancies were found uh, among the stage two and stage three diseases. Comparison with other studies. As I uh, I have mentioned, Dr. Arumugam P. et al. in 2017 at Department of Transfusion Medicine conducted a study to resolve ABO discrepancies encountered by serological workup. They analyzed and resolved 21 samples. Another study was conducted by S. M. Bankani in 2013 on blood group genotyping in lymphoma patients. He found 19 out of 37 patients have discrepancies. My results differ from above mentioned studies. Reason can be the pediatric population or the sample size. Conclusion: A significant number of lymphoma and solid organ, uh, solid organ tumor patients undergoing chemotherapy develop these blood group discrepancies. Due to this reason, all blood banks before issuing blood to these patients should carefully interpret the results of forward and reverse blood grouping in order to issue safe blood units. Thank you so much. Okay, now thank you so much, Anam Praveen, for sharing your research work. And now I would like to invite our next speaker. uh anam sayam she's a student of mphil in molecular biology and she's currently working as a medical lab technologist at children's hospital lahore uh, she will be presenting her paper on nta and ntb titer among blood group o donors at children's hospital lahore so over to you anam sayam assalam alaikum everyone my name is anam sayam and i am going to present my research on topic nta and ntb titer among blood group o donors in children hospital lahore uh, group o donors are readily available in our environment and are used as universal donors in various environments uh, however high titer igg nta and ntb hemolysins in the donor blood can cause destruction of recipient rbcs previously various studies reported the presence of these hemolysins and the results showed wide variations the objective of my study was to determine prevalence of nta and ntb hemolysins among blood group o donors and the titers of igm and igg nta and ntb among these donors um this was an observational study conducted at the department of hematology and transfusion medicine the children hospital and the institute of child health lahore from october 2019 to january 2020 a total of 350 voluntary and healthy group o donors were included in the study those included 320 males and 30 females with median age 27 years plus minus 6.4 st the serum was separated and analyzed within 24 hours in house prepared a cells b cells and o cells were used o cells served as negative control test for hemolysins scoring and antibody titration for igm and igg nta and ntb were performed according to american association of blood bank technical manual 19th edition igm nta and ntb titers were determined first then all the samples were incubated at 37 degrees celsius with a cells b cells and o cells for 1 hour the supernatant was observed and graded for hemolysis the samples positive for hemolysis were further evaluated to determine 
the titer of IgG, NTA, and NTB hemolysins. Um, moving on to results, the donor ages were between 18 and 50 years. Hemolysis were observed in total 50 samples. Out of 50 samples showing uh, this graph here plots degree of hemolysis against the percentage of hemolysins. Um, a total out of 50 samples uh, showing hemolysis score of one plus was observed in majority of the samples for both anti-A and anti-B hemolysins. Uh, the overall prevalence of anti-A and anti-B hemolysins came out to be 15.9%. Hemolytic anti-A and anti-B alone were observed in 9.1% and 3.4% donor samples respectively, while 1.7% donor samples had both anti-A and anti-B hemolysins. Um, titer values for IgM, NTA, and NTB ranged from 2 to 256. NTA and NTB titer levels greater than 64 were observed in 65.6% and 54.9% donor samples, respectively. The most frequently observed IgM titers for NTA was 64 in 29.4% samples while for uh, NTB, uh, it was 32 in 24.9% donor samples. Um, this graph shows titer of uh, IgM and T, different titers of IgM and NTA and NTB against their respective frequencies. Uh, titer values for IgG, NTA, and NTB ranged from 4 to 128. The prevalence of IgG, NTA was higher than that of IgG, NTB in the study population. Uh, most frequently observed IgG, NTA titer was 16, uh, and of IgG, NTB was 64. Uh, this graph shows titer of IgG, NTA, and NTB against their respective frequencies. And we can see the most frequently observed titer for IgG, NTA was 16, and uh, for IgG, NTB was 64. The mean and median values uh, of uh, were higher in NTB in both the IgG, IgM and IgG classes. According to a study by Sood et al. 2016, the prevalence of NTA and NTB hemolysins among blood group O donors at Second City Hospital, New Delhi, India was reported to be 60.5%. OEDG et al. 2015 reported an overall prevalence of NTA and NTB hemolysins to be 30.3% in the group O donor population of Lagos University Teaching Hospital, Nigeria. Kagu et al. in 2010 reported 55.4% prevalence of NTA and NTB hemolysins in blood donors of the National Blood Transfusion Service, Nigeria. The prevalence of NTA and NTB hemolysins in uh, my study population is lower than that of previous study reports. The reason might be demographics, change of demographics, and ethnicity of the donors. Uh, the conclusion of the study was that hemolytic NTA and NTB antibodies do exist in significant frequencies in group O donors in Children's Hospital Lahore. Transfusion of blood group O uh, to known O recipients should be done after evaluating the titer of NTA and NTB hemolysins to ensure the safety of the recipient. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anam Sayam, for sharing your research work regarding NTA and NTB titers among our group O donors at uh, Children's Hospital. Uh, so this was uh, all for the three poster, uh, three poster presentations. I'm going to invite our next speaker, Dr. Muhammad Hassan Hayat. He's currently working as senior instructor hematology at Aachen University Hospital. Uh, he did his FCPS in hematology from Aachen University Hospital and also worked at uh, Shaukat Khan Khanam Memorial Hospital, Lahore. Uh, he'll be presenting uh, his uh, talk on uh, quality control in transfusion medicine. So over to you, Dr. Hassan. 
I am Dr. Mohammad Jassif from Abhashan University Hospital and uh, I am thankful for uh, PSA organizing committee to give me this opportunity uh, to talk on this topic uh, on this conference. So I have nothing to uh, disclose uh, regarding any uh, financial relationship. So first of all, uh, a little about the definitions of quality, quality control, and quality assurance. So, um, quality is the degree to which a product or service uh, complies with the uh, uh, with the desired uh, result. And there are uh, many aspects of um, quality in blood bank and laboratory. Uh, there are certain definitions. For example, the uh, the most uh, uh, the most initial uh, definition is regarding quality is quality control, which is the set of activities. For ensuring quality in the products, and um, uh, it was the most uh, you may say that uh, primitive term used uh, regarding quality in blood bank, uh, where uh, the uh, technologists on the bench perform the quality control of different regions. Then, uh, uh, then coming to uh, a higher level, which is quality assurance, which is uh, basically a system or set of activities for ensuring quality in the processes by which the products are developed. So uh, and the and uh, uh, and then the quality system is above the quality assurance and this is the coordinated set of activities to direct and control and organization with uh, regards to the quality. So there is a certain quality system uh, essential. Basically, these are the building blocks of uh, quality management systems, and these were defined by several organizations like ISO, CLSI, and uh, American Association of Blood Bank, and they are being endorsed by WHO. And each one is very uh, important in its own, and when integrated, these make an efficient quality management system. So uh, in today, my talk, uh, um, today I will discuss these uh, uh, quality system essential uh, one by one. So first of all, uh, the first is the organization. Uh, it is the uh, the quality system uh, uh, which is defined and documented should be documented in the job description of each um, member of the management system. Basically, quality is not a job of a single person or a or a committee. Rather, it, it is a joint effort by all. So the role of each individual uh, with respect to um, uh, with the uh, quality should be mentioned and properly documented and also monitored uh, by the organization. For example, uh, bench technologists are involved in day-to-day -day quality control activities and the manager and head of transfusion medicine are involved in the making and implementation of policies and the quality control team uh, monitors these activities. Furthermore, there should be a clear documentation of relationship between the blood bank and the hospital services, uh, the, the reporting relationship of employees within the blood bank and uh, to the hospital blood evaluation committee. The second is personnel. Uh, the most important asset of a blood bank or any place is a qualified, competent, and motivated uh, motivated staff. So, um, first of all, at the time of hiring, uh, the qualification of the staff should be considered that they are properly qualified. Then, training is very important. Training is again uh, uh, there. There is some initial training, and there is uh, that. Ongoing periodic training, for example, annual lectures, annual uh, uh, training workshops, and there should be competency assessment of the staff as well, which is again uh, being done uh, initially at the time of hiring and then uh, annually or uh, biannually. So, this training and competency uh, should go on uh, simultaneously. We assess the competency of the staff and then arrange training accordingly. Secondly, the motivation is very important because uh, quality control and uh, quality management uh, is, you uh, said, it is uh, extra work uh, being it on the bench where or the extra documentation. So the staff need uh, some recognition in the form of certificate bonus or any other thing. And the personal records of all staff should be maintained there. The third is equipment. So the right equipment choice is very important and then the correct installation is very important and proper and continuous maintenance. And this ensure uh, the uh, it is required the operator training regular maintenance and electric, electrical safety checks. 
so these are uh, this is the example of the maintenance of some equipment which are commonly used in black bank and uh, these are being usually done by the bench staff but sometimes uh, the equipment required uh, periodic maintenance by the biomedical engineers so uh, most of these uh, require the maintenance or you may the quality control daily even so early and some require the maintenance on the daily basis and these instrument uh, include all from the donor area to the grouping bench to the cross match uh, hepatitis and hiv serology and uh, aphasis machine all then the purchase and inventory is very important we should consider the supplier qualification and the um, agreement with these uh, suppliers and the uh, good uh, purchase and inventory management ensures that there is no uh, waste of the resources it also ensures un uninterrupted availability of the regions and cost effectiveness then there is a uh, process management the process management is the basically the main uh, the main part or the central part which involves the uh, the making and implementation of policies and sops regarding each and every procedure done in blood bank Uh, either it is a donor uh, donor recruitment or the issuance of the blood products, the QC of agents, uh, everything. Then the change in the control document should be uh, regular and uh, should be properly documented. Validation and verification of instrument and methods is very important. Uh, the validation of computer system and LIS is also included in this. And then the uh, process control, including the quality control of agents, quality control of equipment, and the quality control of blood components. Basically, the validation and verification are more or less same. The validation is usually uh, is the process of uh, proving that a procedure, process, system, equipment, or method used is uh, uh, is expected uh, to achieve the intended result. And the validation is done for the test for either the uh, method uh, because if if you have uh, two machines or three machines, you have to validate each and individually and against each other. And uh, if you have two methods or even a single method for a test, you should also validate against each other. And the frequency of validation is that you should validate any instrument or method at the time of implementation, and then there should be biannual validation or after the any major maintenance. The verification is then um, uh, to log to log verification, and the when new shipment uh, arrives. Calibration and control. Uh, the commercial calibrators is the standards uh, which are recommended by manufacturer, and and these are used at specified frequency either at the day of use or uh, daily. Uh, the package insert range should be considered, and these uh, should also be validated at the uh, place of uh, utilization. You should also verify the range in package insert given by manufacturer, and then each log of control material is verified before the current log log finishes. And for the qualitative test, we have mostly we have qualitative test in blood bank, so we use negative and positive controls. And for the quantitative test, we have high, low, and uh, other type of uh, controls. The QC of agent in blood bank is very important, and we should check the activity and specificity of all typing CRs, whether it is A, B, or Coombs uh, agent and all the agent cells. And the each cell used in antibody screening must be checked. At each day of use for the activity of at least one antigen. So, if you are using a screening panel, you should at least uh, uh, check one uh, one antigen for the degree of reactivity. These are the uh, most uh, commonly used antisera used in blood bank. So, uh, most uh, uh, reagents and antisera and cells, and even hemoglobinometer, the reagent for. Uh, Infectious disease screening, antibody screening, identification. Uh, these uh, um, quality control of these agents and antisera are performed daily. While the the rare antisera or antibody agent albumin and the Coombs control cell, these are uh, the quality control of these agents are done at the day of the use. The use of expired agent is very important, and uh, it is it is applied under the condition where the agents are there. And not easily available, and the delay or the when delivery of new shipment is delayed, and there should be a clear cut policy regarding the use of these expired agent, and these should be uh, implemented and used uh, with the consultation of the uh, 
transcendental medicine had or liberty had. Uh, so the, the most uh, the most important point is that they these should be discarded if, if their QC is unacceptable, or uh, when when you receive a new item, then you should uh, discard these expired data. So the, now the most important uh, is the QC of blood components. Uh, this is uh, from these guidelines that are from the WHP and National Association of Blood Banks, and uh, they guide about the uh, quality control of all blood components, being like fatty cell, fresh frozen plasma, cryo precipitate, liquid concentrate, and phase unit. So uh, the for Patriarch cell, the hematocrit should be less than 60 to 80, uh, should be 60 to 80 percent with no bacterial detection in four units or one percent of the uh, unit in a month. Uh, the 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 A W W B did not uh, give any quality control recommendation for fresh frozen plasma. So these are from local authorities, and they state that the factor eight level should be more than 0.7 intonation per ml in a plasma. Likewise, for cryo precipitate, the very double we recommend that um, uh, you should send four units for factor eight and fifty region uh, levels, and these should be more than 18 international units and 150 milligram, respectively. The quality control of platelet component is important because it also includes uh, the side platelet count, it also includes the pH, and the bacteria growth should be monitored in each and every unit produced by the blood bank. In the documents and um, record management, basically documents are the uh, written information about policies, process, and procedures. For example, SOPs, quality manual, and job descriptions. While the record and the collected information produced by the lab in process of performing the patient testing. So all type of uh, donor records, patient records should be maintained for the recommended period. These uh, these recommendation are from the College of American Pathologists. So mostly, uh, mostly data should be kept for at least five to ten years, but uh, certain records are to be kept for uh, indefinite period. For example, the permanently deferred donors and the transfusion problems such as difficulty in blood typing, transfusion yet. So to these type of record is very important for patient and human safety, and this should be uh, kept for indefinite period. Now the Assessment is very important. It is the two types of assessment. First is internal assessment and external assessment. So the advantage of internal assessment over external assessment is that it can be continuous uh, monitoring of uh, effective uh, uh, the, the efficacy of the quality management system. And these are of three types. The first is compliance inspections in which the, uh, the local or the uh, hospital or laboratory quality team uh, inspect the blood bank and uh, check the compliance of different standard uh, against the approved checklist. And there are certain uh, quality indicators which are monitored by the hospital committee or the quality assurance department of the hospital, for example, the CT ratio, the frequency of adverse reactions, and ABO mismatch transfusions. Uh, the, the most important and the uh, effective are the internal audit. So in internal audit, these are these may be retrospective, which are called case audit, in which the auditor select a, a, a random blood unit and then trace accordingly, and whichever person, uh, uh, whichever person are involved uh, in the processing of that unit, uh, they check the competency and training of these staff. They interview them, they, they observe them, and then they trace all the uh, all the track the, which through which the Product has been gone through, and uh, these include the equipment reports, product QC reports, the PT surveys of that test or product, uh, the procedure and policies regarding that product, and the, any deviation um, recorded from these product. Then there may be uh, certain prospective uh, internal audits in which the observer directly uh, um, observe or interview the uh, technologist or the quality department. And uh, the, the external assessment is of two types. The first is proficiency testing, um, in which uh, the lab or blood bank receives the sample from an external agency. They analyze them, and uh, the result was sent, and then compare with other labs or blood banks, and then um, they give you the feedback regarding your performance. 
and then there, there are certain external inspection in which the the accrediting body or the certifying body for example for the american pathology so american social blood bank they visit your center and they check the compliance of the standard checklist so this, for example this is a this is an example of proficiency testing survey um it is uh, sent from uh, sent by college of american pathology so you we see that these involve uh, all of the the most of the tests performed in blood bank being a antibody titer direct wound test red cell antigen typing usual absorption in use of group typing uh cross match and educational surveys in the uh, viral marker for hbc hiv then information information management is very important the general communication between uh staff which is uh, which may be internally or with the external parties like patient attendants visitors auditors should be well documented and and uh, the all the memos given to staff meeting minutes communication with other departments email they should be properly documented and maintained in record i mean uh, likewise the laboratory system should uh, accurate and uh, timely information to manage the care of patients and the, uh, it should be comply with the regulation that effect there gives the other important thing is the occurrence or non performance management uh, and it involves the documentation of the event with classification for example accident error uh, um, deviation so these are all type of uh, non performance and then um, the evaluation of the root cause root, root cause analysis is very important and then corrective action and preventive action are implemented and these action uh, then will be analyzed Uh, about their effectiveness process in, in improvement may be identified from the deviation reports the customer complaints qc reports proficiency testing results internal audits and the external assessment and um, this is an example of uh, of a plan for the process improvement there are certain models for example six sigma models and others uh but the most uh, commonly used method is the plan to check and act in which you plan a change or test uh, which is which is aimed towards an improvement then uh, then you uh, carry out the change and then check the result that what we learn or what went wrong and then you either decide to uh, adopt the change or leave the change customer satisfaction satisfaction is also very important for blood bank the customers are donors so uh, a donor um, a donor should be satisfied according to uh, uh, satisfy for his recruitment in a safe blood donation the other customers for blood bank are the transfusion services we basically use the blood uh, these are physicians nurses surgeons uh, and then the of course the patient who receive the transfusion should uh, both of these um, require a properly labeled compatible Blood which should be free of any uh, infectious uh, organism. So uh, these all customers should be satisfied. And then the blood bank should consider requests for expanding existing services or the introduction of new services from various departments. The last is the facilities and safety. So regarding the uh, facilities and safety, these should be. Uh, all type of safety the being general safety biological safety chemical radiation fire safety and the institute and the institute of blood bank should have a plan for disaster management uh, there should be a proper uh, plan for ventilation sanitation and disposable of hazards certain examples of um, of um, facilities and safety management blood bank include the provision of safety hoods the component storage area the se separate benches for specified work uh, donor area and the uh, the most important the irrigated room so in summary the quality management can ensure consistency of product uh, reliable results effective risk based decision making and reduction in wastage through minimization of the errors and uh, it should provide a strong basis for donor product and staff safety so likewise um, the success of the journey not a destination so is the uh, true quality which is also a journey not a destination because there is always a room for improvement thank you
thank you so much, Dr. Asim, for your enlightening talk on quality control in transfusion medicine. Now for our next talk, uh, I hope uh, that the technical difficulties uh, have now resolved and uh, she may be able to share her screen. So over to you, Dr. Barbara, for your uh, talk on quality in the hematology lab. Yes, thank you. And my apologies. Uh, I, I seem to just not to be not to be able to um, uh, actually to uh, share my share my screen or join as a uh, as a panelist, so I'm hoping this will now work without any any problems. Um, let me just uh, right. Um, could you just confirm that you can see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yes, that's we fantastic. Can. Thank you. My apologies. Um, right. Many thanks for your patience. Um, my name is Barbara de la Salle. I'm actually, as already uh, been announced, um, I'm the director for UK Necrise Hematology and a board member for the International Society of Laboratory Hematology. And I was just going to give a talk today on quality in the hematology laboratory. So I have no disclosures to make. And what I hope to be able to cover is to be able to look at a definition of end-to-end -end quality management, to understand the impact and incidence of uh, errors in the different phases of laboratory hematology, to raise awareness of harmonization and standardization in laboratory hematology, and to review recent guidance on the use of IQC from the International Council for um, uh, Standardization in Hematology. And I'm just going to swap my screens. Um, okay, harmonization in laboratory medicine. Uh, there are many drivers for this, and it's something that's been increasing many, many times over the last, last few decades. Uh, one of the increasing trends is towards consolidating and consolidation and networking of clinical laboratories. Um, general national, international quality uh, assurance accreditation programs, which require greater use of clinical governance. Advances in information technology and uh, shared electronic patient records also uh, mean that um, uh, there is an increasing need to harmonize the output from different, uh, from different laboratories. The drivers of these uh, standardizations, which have largely focused on the analytical phase, have been technological in terms of the scientific and technological developments, computer technology, uh, changing diagnostic pathways from patients, there have been political and general governance and management issues in, uh, driven by patients' expectations, uh, healthcare governance and the funding of healthcare, where all of our, all of our um, uh, funders are require us to get more and more quality and better quality and more out of every penny that is spent or every, every dollar or cent that is spent. Um, and also, I think the most important driver has been changing service provision with changing skill mix and the quality management systems and professional expectations of our laboratory staff and clinical colleagues. This has meant that we're now in a, in a situation where most errors are actually not in the analytical phase. Um, if we look at the paper here from uh, 10 years ago now from, from Professor Plabani, um, we, we can see that, uh, that, that two thirds of, of errors are now occurring in the pre-analytical phase and maybe up to a quarter or more errors in the post-analytical phase, which means that the work that has been done in the, in the analytical phase, i.e. The, the elements actually within the laboratory or where we are analyzing the sample have been extremely successful uh, in their outcomes. Um, I'm going to start, however, with some focus on the analytical phase and, and where those, uh, some of those uh, efforts and some of those uh, impacts have been felt, and then to look a little bit more at the pre-analytical and post-analytical phase after that. Um, the, the total testing process can be broken down. We often think of just pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical. It is often now divided even further into pre-pre-analytical, which comes down to the actual selection of the test and the, the bleeding of the patients through to the processing of the, 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 the sample when it arrives in the laboratory, then what goes on to the actual laboratory analyzer, the interpretation and, and the, the uh, actions taken afterwards, and then in the post-post analytical phase, the actual correct actions by the clinician on, those, um, on, on the output from the laboratory. 
the impact on the in the analytical phase has been very much focused on reducing intermeth intermethod variability so that we can actually say that the result from one laboratory is the same as that from another and these have relied on three main three main areas the calibration and traceability of the test that we are using uh, quality monitoring in terms of IQC, uh, internal quality control and external quality assessment or proficiency texting and the audit and accreditation of services. There's also been a lot of harmonisation, I think, nowadays in terms of reference ranges and action points and the units of measurement so that we do not confuse our clinical colleagues in giving in, in, the, in the results that are, in, that are issued and allow them to interpret them in a more uh, straightforward fashion. Traceability and commutability is, is something that has been talked about enormously and, and we most of us be, will be familiar with the traceability ladder. The, the idea being here is that the result from the, from the individual for, that is provided for the individual laboratory for the individual patient is traceable all the way to a higher level reference material. And therefore the results from one method and one laboratory are are compared to uh, our results from today's run or, or this week's run or this hour's run are the same as the previous run. And within our external quality assessment, are the results of my laboratory similar to or comparable to those from other laboratories, in particular those using the same technology? IQC is something that we are all familiar with. We will all use very widely um, day to, from day to day within the laboratory. However, the, the, there is still, uh, I think, uncertainty and diversity in what the actual process and what, what materials and what um, should be done in order to make sure we are using the optimum IQC uh, arrangements. So are we doing sufficient IQC? Are we not wasting too much of the laboratory's valuable resources? on doing excessive IQC. So for that reason, uh, there is now in, um, it's actually in publication, uh, a paper from the International Council for Standardization in Haematology on the use of internal quality control for blood cell analyzers. And this has the aim to produce a consensus guideline for IQC for haematology cell counters. It will consider methods, materials used and validation of, um, um, validation of those, the frequency of IQC testing and statistical methods to be used to determine significance of IQC test results. I would here refer people to the ICSH website if you're not used to this. Um, the ICSH, all the guidelines that are produced are available on the ICSH website and these are available free of charge. There is no cost for downloading or using these and I think that is very important across the, across the world. So this uh, guideline uh, noted that there are a number of accepted IQC practices in, in say in full blood count testing. These are calibration and verification, the use of stabilized IQC materials, the use of moving averages, often known as Bull's algorithm, a sort of statistical approach, the use of retained patient samples to, to use for uh, inter-instrument inter comparisons, the use of Delta check for patients' results to, to check, uh, which will help with some of the pre-analytical phases, such as has, have, have you got the right blood in the tube, and the verifications of unexpected results by other means, uh, for example, the use of blood films. So looking at those particular approaches, the ICSH undertook a survey. It reviewed the literature from the International Standards Organization, the College of American Pathologists, and uh, the CLSI organization to see what the literature suggested. It also undertook surveys in, of IQC, recommended IQC practice with instrument manufacturers and with a, a number of laboratories across the world, both Europe, China, and various other countries. Um, and we got in total in the end, there were uh, um, uh, 191 responses in the end from, from laboratories on IQC. Uh, practice. And one of the objectives was to estimate the failure limits in IQC that was used by the laboratory. So it was a comprehensive survey. I don't have time to go into all of the aspects of this. However, what the survey did reveal was that there's quite a lot of diversity in the quality practice. 
Um, there's, di there's diversity in the derivation of the action limits used for IQC. 54% uh, of laboratories did not use moving, uh, moving averages in those surveys, and nearly 90% of laboratories did not use retained patient samples to assess the precision and interlaboratory comparison. And there's just some, some um, returns there on those, those three main, uh, main aspects uh, that, that, are, that are being published in the paper. And you can see there, there were responses there from China, Ireland, Spain, the United Kingdom, so quite a wide range of um, quite a wide range of countries. Um, there were also they also the, the the responses all covered all of the main uh, analyzer groups. There are differences in regulatory guidance between the the main. Uh, uh, publishers of regulatory guidance, in, 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 and that would cover ISO, the College of American Pathologists, and the CLSI organization. And there were variations also in manufacturers' recommendations, depending upon the geographic area in which their uh, machines were being, were being sold. So, um, on the basis of that, and of course, this is very, this is quite a long, this is very comprehensive and long paper in actual fact, and I think will actually be published in two parts, back to back, um, in 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 the in in the, in the near future. Um, the recommendations um, of the that are held in the paper um, on IQC methods are that the um, that the, the the laboratory should use a manufacturer's commercial control or the equivalent for every reported parameter that is every parameter that is reported for the patients in and in the full blood count um, you should use a third party control if that is shown to add value. And there is a lot of confusion over third party controls. Uh, it is something that certainly within um, uh, the ISO standard it, 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 for laboratories, it is recommended that third party controls are used. However, if you look, many, uh, if you look at the actual source of what is being sold as a third party control, um, many of these are only the same material as is being, as is being provided um, from the manufacturer's control. There are really, in terms of commercial control materials, there are really only two main manufacturers of this uh, globally uh, in cell counting. So yes, use a third party control if it is shown to add value to your, to your quality control program. It is recommended that patient mean analysis, so the, the x bar the Bull's algorithm, is used to detect drift in your results. Um, it is also recommended that retained patient samples are used to assess inter-instrument performance. So if you have more than one analyzer in your laboratory, um, then you can use retained patient samples to cross-check from one analyzer to another. Uh, Delta checks should be used, and these usually can be supplied through the laboratory information management system, um, to, to check the results of your patient today with the patient, with, the, with his or her results that might have been from yesterday or last month, because this will help detect pre-analytical errors in patient sampling and patient labelling. And where you get an unusual blood film result, or you get, sorry, where you get an unusual blood count result, for example, an unusual platelet count result or a, an unexpected white count result, then these can be verified by, the, by other methods. For example, the use of blood film examination. In terms of the derivation of, of IQC target limits, it was recommend, it is recommended in the paper that the laboratories should work on these and should tighten these over what is supplied by the manufacturer. So if you where you are using the manufacturer's um, control material and the supply and the manufacturers or the suppliers target values, you should verify these and be happy that they are that, that you, you produce those within your within your laboratory. The laboratory should be calculating the standard deviation of their action limits um, uh, from the target values. And uh, this, uh, you know, for example, that there, there are methods for doing that, for example, in the CLSI H26 guideline. And these can be tightened uh, and, and these can be used to tighten the manufacturer's limits. Um, you may hear within the laboratory need to um, use some of your own judgment as to how far to, to, to tighten those and on the clinical significance of the parameter that is actually used. 
And then also within the laboratory to observe closely the performance and trend analysis of any commercial control material over time. So although your control material may be within limits, if it is trending or if it's only just within limits, that is an indication that you should be, um, you should be uh, undertaking some investigation. So going on from that, so uh, that paper, as I say, is in publication. It's been accepted for publication. Um, it will be um, published in the IJLA channel and will be available on the, um, the International Council for uh, Standardization in Hematology's uh, website. Um, so a lot of work there on IQC, which, which clearly has, has improved hugely the performance in the analytical phase. Um, why, so why is IQC just not enough on its own? Well, quotable acceptable ranges, as has just been demonstrated in this particular paper, um, are, are on control serum preparations are often very wide. And that is why one of the recommendations is that these should be looked at and tightened within the laboratory if possible. Um, a method or instrument by, uh, may be within the control range, but it may still be biased. So you may be just only just within the control range. So it is useful to have other uh, armaments in the quality management system. Um, good IQC, and, and this is a particular concern of mine, always relies very much on the integrity and skill of the individual operator or the organisation. Um, if you run IQC, uh, unless you're of a machine that, that will actually lock you out and not allow you to proceed uh, with any further patients analyses if your IQC has failed, um, you, you will then, um, you know, there, there, there may be a temptation um, it, within an individual practitioner or an individual organisation to overlook, uh, to overlook um, outlier results, to overlook where a run is out of consensus. So, you know, it is very much reliant on the integrity of the individual practitioner. Um, and IQC also is, it cannot really compare across methods. Um, you are only looking at your own analyzers and in your own laboratory. So for that reason, there is a role still for uh, external quality assessment or proficiency testing, where, an, uh, the, which, where you would test uh, the, the results from a group of laboratories, where each tests the identical specimens of a known but undisclosed content. Um, and this allows your laboratory to have a long-term retrospective and independent assessment of laboratory performance. It will not tell you whether today's results are right, but it will tell you whether your laboratory is trending in a manner that needs some action. And it is now recognized as an essential part of quality management. Um, so it will assess the standard of results produced by each laboratory and its performance relative to others. It allows the interlaboratory comparison of results. It gives an indication of bias from the consensus or the target. And it will demonstrate competence of your laboratory to third parties. And that is particularly important uh, in terms of accreditation. Most accreditation bodies do require some form of interlaboratory comparison, and that is most typically external quality assessment. Also in, in higher level EQA programs, it does allow laboratories to learn from others. It allows the sharing of best practice, either within the EQA provider or through other professional bodies, your, your national professional societies. Um, and where, where the, the materials that are actually issued by the EQA provider are commutable, i.e. they provide comparable results from one method to another, it will allow state-of-the-art performance assessment of the method or the kit or the laboratory practice. So there is an important learning and educational element. There are, however, many, harm, many challenges for, for external quality assessment providers in terms of harmonization, because although EQA has a key role in identifying intermethod variability, uh, the need to stabilize materials, and this is especially, especially so in, in, in cell counting, it may mean that the EQA materials are not computable, commutable. And the problem here is, is that uh, most EQA providers need to be able to distribute their material. This would take several days. And for something like full blood count or, or the, the CBC, um, we all know that CBC material is ideally only analyzed within a matter of hours. The materials therefore have to be stabilized and that stabilization affects the red cell membranes and then often sadly rec uh, renders the materials non-commutable. 
Therefore, if you are looking at uh, using EQA data for harmonization studies, it is important to understand that commutability. There is also evidence, especially within uh, some chemical parameters, that reagent lots must be taken into account and, and, and EQA can help um, uh, assess the comparability of one reagent lot to another. And I would say that a lot of the work in harmonization is, has been undertaken with plasma and serum analytes because of the challenges with, the, with cell counting. So then returning to the total testing process, we've looked very much at the control of the analytical phase where we are not making many errors nowadays, perhaps less than 10% of the errors in laboratory medicine are now occur in the analytical phase. So what do we do about the others, the pre-analytical and the post-analytical phases? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't matter how good your analytical phase is, if there are problems with the, the materials that are coming into the laboratory for testing, so you do not have the right patient, the right specimen, and it has been taken in the right time frame, it doesn't matter how good your analytical procedures are, you will not produce an adequate or uh, a useful, a clinically useful result. And the result may be inaccurate, there may be missed diagnoses or delayed results, and as a, sub, as a result of that, poor clinical decisions. And this, I think, is one of the major problems within laboratory medicine and laboratory haematology of um, quality management um, in, the, um, um, in, in, the, in the next few years. Um, the international standard that covers laboratory practice, ISO 15189, does require laboratories to establish quality indicators to evaluate performance throughout all phases. This is a little bit tough on the laboratory because often, because often the pre-analytical phases may be a little bit beyond their control. However, the laboratory should have documented processes for, uh, for their pre documented procedures for their pre-examination process to ensure the validation results. And in many cases, this often amounts just to monitoring the incidence of errors, the number of rejections, the number of sample rejections within what is received by the laboratory. Um, there was an excellent paper that was actually produced by the European Federation of Laboratory Medicine. Again, this is freely available um, uh, from the EFLM, which looked at many of the issues around sample collection and, and quality. Um, and within haematology, just to list some of these, um, they may be um, samples collected from the wrong collection site where they may be contaminated with infusion fluid or they may be hemolyzed, uh, poor collection technique with excessive venous stasis or the wrong gauge of needle, samples collected into the wrong uh, anticoagulant or the wrong spasming container or the wrong volume, clotted samples, which is the most common cause of sample rejection within haematology, underfilled and overfilled specimen tubes, and um, samples which are either over or under mixed. And these are all have, have been demonstrated to affect the outcome of the results in within the laboratory. Um, and I would recommend this paper to you because it gives a lot of very detailed guidance on um, sample collection and the quality impact of, of uh, poor sample collection. Transport and handling is obviously also enormously important within haematology. Any prolonged transport times, uh, the uh, poor storage temperatures or, or too high storage temperature or freezing samples will also destroy haematology samples. Pneumatic delivery, tube delivery systems have caused problems with platelet counts in some patients, patients with particularly fragile platelets, which probably which are those on, um, uh, for example, on leukemia uh, treatment and excessive or inadequate missing, mixing before analysis. And we certainly see this as a major problem within the EQA results that are returned. And they will cause morphological train changes, um, incorrect cell counts, uh, red count platelets and uh, white cells and changes in MCV. Uh, there are a number of error monitoring programs which allow the laboratory to track the numbers of errors. Again, there's little standardization. I've listed three here that are, are, are reasonably widely used. Um, and, and well-established programs, but there's little harmonization between the, the um, 
the, the, these error monitoring programs, even in terms of the quality indicators that are used and the numbers of quality indicators used, they may range between seven or eight up to 50. And, and that I think is very confusing for the laboratory. And it leads to what I've put in the diagram here, which is the quality indicators paradox, which is that everybody thinks that it's a good idea to collect these um, results, but few laboratories actually manage to do it successfully um, on an ongoing process. So just to summarise in my final slide, um, I would just like to say that demonstrating quality within haematology, it relies very much on our quality system, so our use of IQC and EQA, our adherence to accreditation um, uh, standards and, and, and accreditation and audit of our processes, our use, our compliance with guidelines and the harmonisation of units at reference intervals to make our results comparable with those from other um, laboratories. There are also uh, issues around the individual practitioner, which the previous speaker did cover in terms of blood transfusion. These are equally, uh, these are equally applicable within haematology and any laboratory medicine um, practice, which is for the individual practitioner, uh, the use of their, 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 their having their correct examinations, qualifications and their professional registration, and then ongoing within the laboratory, their training, their CPD and appraisal, and their, their monitoring of their competence. So with that, I would just like to say thank you everybody and apologies for the technical difficulties. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Barbara, for your Stop. very informative and enlightening Sharing. talk regarding uh, quality in the hematology lab. Now, moving on to our next speaker, I would like to invite Dr. Naila Raza Rehman. She's currently working as Assistant Professor of Hematology at Liaquat National Hospital, Karachi. Uh, her areas of expertise include anemia, clotting disorders, and hemophilia. She will be discussing morphology in common uh, hematological disorders. So over to you, Dr. Naila. Thank you, uh, Sahar. Um, I'm Dr. Naila, as you may be knowing. So the topic assigned to me is uh, common morphological abnormalities seen in uh, uh, CBC findings. Okay, so uh, let's start with the I'll try to share my screen first. Okay, now, can you see it? Can you hear yes. me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you and we can also see your screen and your presentation. Right, good. Um, as I mentioned before, that uh, morphology or review of peripheral smear still remains an uh, integral part of uh, complete blood count despite recent advances in automated analyzers and even the introduction of uh, artificial intelligence for comprehending human tissues, which is just around the corner, but still in uh, uh, third world countries and even in advanced countries, uh, a good morphology can take you places, right? So, in my talk, I'll just uh, mention the major salient indications for slide review and the role of a good quality smear that plays in helping uh, your morphological findings. And then we will have a slideshow about some common morphological abnormalities of different blood cells. And then a few tips at the end, how to be a skill morphologist. I have uh, no disclosures. All right. So when is a peripheral smear review indicated? It is a uh, routine requirement of complete blood count, uh, especially in those uh, areas where a three-part differential is available or a five-part five differential is available. It provides important diagnostic information about any underlying disorder related to any of the blood cells. It confirms or even corrects the quantitative values of the CBC, a major example of which is uh, when we correct the circulating normoblast uh, causing an inflated WBC count. Then it is always recommended when the automated analyzer gives a flag. So before embarking on reviewing the slide, there are some major prerequisites to make a quality smear. 
The anticoagulation of choice is potassium EDTA because it preserves the morphology the best. Sorry. Uh, the sample should be analyzed within two hours of collection. If there is a delay, then you can store the sample in the refrigerator uh, at two to six degrees centigrade for 24 hours. Or if there is further delay, you can make a dry smear and fix it before staining. Uh, the group of dyes uh, belonging to Romanesky group should be used for staining, whichever dye you are used to. Uh, you should make sure that the smear is made on a clean glass slide using wedge techniques. And here is an example of a typical tongue shape or wedge shape smear, which should be properly stained for review. All right, when we go to the microscope, first we have a bird's eye view at low power, and then we go to the high power, either uh, mostly we review slides at uh, in 240, or uh, for those of you who are more expert in 220 also does, because you have a long uh, you know, tray of slides to review, so. Uh, you have to be skilled enough to assess any abnormality. All right, coming to the morphological abnormalities, first related to red blood cells. Uh, it could be because of irregular distribution of the cells, or it could be defect in the size, defect in the chromia or the color of the cells, Defect in the shape of the cells, mostly involving defects in the membrane or the structure of the cell. And then we have red cell inclusion bodies, which are either remnants of uh, different cellular components or hemoparasites. So the irregular distribution of RBCs over here, they are mostly produced because of exogenous effects, either due to the presence of increased proteins in the plasma causing RBCs to stack together. This is called rule of emission, and it should be sought at the area where the cells are just touching each other, because if you go deeper, you will see rule of emission in every slide. So the selection of area to review is again very important. Um, then if there are presence of antibodies directed against the cell red cell antigens causing their agglutination, then again, you will see clumping of red cells. Small clumps are seen in a warm type of antibody, whereas larger clumps are seen <coughs> excuse me, in uh, cold agglutinin disease or due to cold antibodies. Uh, whenever you see these cold antibodies, uh, the uh, rest of the indices given by the instrument, they are absolutely unreliable because only it's just the hemoglobin which is given accurately by the instrument. Uh, otherwise, the rest of the indices, they are not reliable and needs to be held and not issued. Coming to the uh, variation in the RBC size, uh, um, there is a uh, red blood uh, index called uh, red cell distribution, width, which tells you about the degree of variation. Okay? So the cell size can be either smaller than normal, make, um, causing these formation of macrocytes, typically seen in hyperchromic anemias and iron deficiency anemias, these microcytes, and they are hypochromic as well. And there are presence of these pencil shaped cells called elliptocytes. They again have a central pillar in between. Okay. And, uh, when the size of the cell is increased, they become macrocytes causing increase in MCV. And uh, here you can see ovalocytes, some teardrop cells and hypersegmented neutrophils. These are the typical findings seen in megaloblastic anemia due to B12 or folate deficiency. Sometimes you will get normal red cell indices. That is because of a dimorphic population of both hypochromic 
microcytic as well as macrocytic morphology seen mostly in cases of malabsorption. So here again, the value of peripheral smear is very important. Or it could be a slight post-transfusion, giving normal indices. All right, coming to the chromia of the red cells, the red cells, sometimes the immature red cells, they are called polychromatic cells. Poly because their, their color is not the typical rust color of the mature hemoglobin, but they contain uh, some remnants of RNA and ribosomes within them due to which they have a dusky gray appearance. And these are large size cells and normally they are present in uh, about 2.5 to 2.5%. Uh, but their concentration increases whenever there is increased stress on the bone marrow due to blood loss or because of hemolysis. A better way of uh, counting these cells is going for uh, using a supravital stain which is the uh, new methylene blue for counting these reticulocytes. And as you can see, this network of RNA remnants uh, make these polychromatic cells on a Romanesky stain slide much more clearer to count. So the chromium of the cells is also important. Now coming to the abnormalities in the red cell shape. Most of these abnormalities are related to the membrane defects. Okay? So you may encounter these spiky cells, which are called spur cells. Uh, the name is derived from acanthocytes. Acantho stands for these thorns. So you can see that they are dense cells with no central pillar and they have got prominent spikes on them. You may also get, uh, this type of cells are mostly seen in uh, 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 lipid or cholesterol uh, uh, irregularities, which causes the membrane to extrude out. Uh, this is a common presentation we come across. These are called crenated red cells and is a cause of a common artifact. If uh, the sample is processed late, then it can give rise to these crenated cells. Otherwise, they have very regular margins around them. Mostly these abnormalities are seen in uremic patients or due to electrolyte imbalances because of these regular number of uh, small spikes, they are called echinocytes. Echino is a word used for a hedgehog or a sea urchin. So this is how cells were initially recognized. Right, another membrane defect is this a common feature. These are the target cells because instead of the clear central pillar in a red cell, the hemoglobin is concentrated in the middle. The main reason is that the surface area to volume ratio, their surface area is increased. So the cell hemoglobin is concentrated in the middle as well. And these target cells are seen in many hemoglobinopathies and they are a common feature of uh, uh, post-plenectomy samples, and they are also seen in acute liver failure. Now, these are teardrop cells. Um, dacrocytes is the older name used to describe them, and they are seen mostly in conditions uh, where the matrix of the bone marrow is disturbed most commonly due to fibrosis of the bone marrow or due to other infiltrative disorders cause, causing formation of these teardrop cells. Now, the, the name spherocytes is self-explanatory. You can see that these cells 
their surface area is reduced as compared to the volume, but the cell has not leaked this hemoglobin. The membrane is somewhat intact and the hemoglobin is packed inside this small volume. This is just opposite to uh, what target cells are made up of. So over here, the cells, they are fragile, and these ferrocytes are a common feature seen in hemolytic anemias. They may be seen in cases of burns as well. And uh, there are certain congenital as well as acquired condition giving rise to spherocytosis. Uh, another uh, common feature which we see along with spherocytes is these bite cells. You can see that there are two major spikes, and this is when the macrophage removes the unstable membrane, leaving a bite mark. And these cells are called dagmocytes, and uh, these cells again are a common feature seen in microangiopathic hemolytic anemias, as well as in certain uh, inherited enzyme deficiencies like G6PD. All right, and these cells, these are the stomatocytes. Stoma uh, means mouth. As you can see that instead of a central pelar, these cells, they have got a slit-like pelar in them. Uh, stomatocyte may be a part of artifact if they are less than 10%, but if they are more than that, then it could be due to certain conditions for example, hereditary stomatocytosis, giving rise to these excessive stomatocytes. All right. This is a typical slide which uh, we come across commonly in our practice. Uh, over here, uh, this is the fragmentation syndrome, or you can say microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. The cells are of various types. The schistocytes are these spiky cells with no central pelar. They are basically the fragmented red cells, which are formed due to the passage of red cells through um, fibrin clog clogged blood vessels as they, and they are ruptured. Keratocytes, they have got two pointed ends whereas uh, microspherocytes are also seen and white cells are present. These findings are seen typically either in TTP, HUS, or DIC. And as you know that uh, this is a medical emergency, whenever you come across these slides, it is very important to inform the concerned doctor about these changes so that uh, rapid measures, treatment measures can be taken. All right. So these are the two slides which are like the, you know, the gospel of red RBC morphology, especially this one. As you can see that every Tom, Dick and Harry cell is present here. These are microsites, there are teardrop cells, there are target cells, there are fragmented cells, schistocytes, and even a normoblast along with polychromasia. And this slide is a typical hallmark of beta thalassemia major. So whenever you come across this slide, uh, it's 99% chances that it's a thalassemia major patient and you need to report it so that uh, the confirmatory test can be performed. Uh, over here, all right, these are typical sickle cells. Uh, previously, we have seen pencil-shaped cells or elliptocytes. We need to differentiate between the two sickle cells. They have dense inner uh, body with pointed ends, whereas elliptocytes have blunted ends with a central pelar. Sickle cells are seen, uh, numerous sickle cells are seen uh, in sickle, uh, thalis, uh, sickle thal syndrome or homozygous sickle cell disease. Over here, you can see a hovel jolly body. So most likely it is a sickle cell disease where the patient has undergone autosplenectomy. 
Now we come to the next part, which is uh, identifying different red cell inclusions present within the cells, which could be either cellular rem remnants or most commonly malarial parasites. Uh, these cellular remnants would be either portions of nucleus or cytoplasm. Those uh, containing nuclear remnants are this. This is a hovel jolly body. It is round spherical, usually confined to one part of the cell. And the, this is a DNA, remnant of DNA. And it is important to differentiate them from platelets superimposing on a, a RBC. As you can see, they are lighter uh, stained, whereas the uh, hobble jolly bodies are dense and dark purple. Cabot rings, they are mainly formed from a uh, mitotic spindle. They don't have much significance, but they are seen in different uh, galloblastic anemias, different types of hemoglobinopathies, and it is important to differentiate them from trophozoites. Now, uh, Pepinheimer bodies, these are base, uh, basically iron uh, molecules, seen in uh, within the red cells. They occur either in twos or threes and they are small in size. They can also be mixed with a ring form of a malarial parasite. But as you can see, there is no ring surrounding these small dots. Basophilic stippling is quite easy to diagnose because they have got this uh, equal size small uh, stipples uh, surrounding this uh, throughout the cytoplasm. And uh, these are basically uh, nuclear remnants as well. Heinz bodies, these are denatured hemoglobin. They are not visible through your routine Romanesky stain. You need to uh, stain them using supravital stain and only then you can recognize them. And uh, these Heinz bodies, when they are the, this uh, denatured hemoglobin, which is removed by the macrophages, they ultimately become the white cells seen in G6PD deficiency. Now, this is uh, your malarial parasite. Uh, we have got two varieties uh, common in our part of the world, Plasmodium vivax and Falciparum. This, uh, uh, this, these are the ring forms. The rings are relatively thicker. They infect larger size cells and they are uh, placed some, not directly attached to one side of the cell. Okay? And these are the growing trophozoites, as you can see. And this is a gametocyte. This here is a schizont containing numerous merozoites which is responsible for causing relapsing fever in P5 X. Whereas uh, this is an example of Plasmodium falciparum. These are delicate rings, usually present at one end of the cell. They may have two signet dots and uh, they infect all size of cells, irrespective of the size of the cells. Uh, these are the gametocytes, which are typically cigar shaped. It is very important to report the presence of especially the ring forms and to give a malarial index when it is requested because a malarial index of more than five is considered uh, 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 very difficult. It is considered uh, risky for the patient's health. Now coming to the abnormalities of WBCs. Uh, we know there could be uh, benign disorders affecting the counts or morph causing morphological changes in the cytoplasm or the nucleus or the most common or the most dreaded the malignant disorders are the leukemias, lymphomas, and plasma cell dyscrasias. So we need to have a sharp eye to identify and differentiate them. You know that uh, in the peripheral blood, you get these segmented neutrophils and you get these stab cells as well because the cells are continuously being in a stage of uh, 
undergoing proliferation, differentiation, and apoptosis. But if these immature cells start coming in the circulation, the term left shift is used. And it indicates either uh, increased need for these neutrophils. These are the different types of uh, WBCs which we encounter in the bifold smear. All right. Starting from the benign disorders, whenever the uh, TLC count is increased due to an increase in the neutrophil count, and over here, you should consider the absolute neutrophil count, which if it is more than 7.5 into 10 to the power 9 per liter, then the term RNL or neutrophilia is used. Most of the time, the most common uh, reason is acute infection, inflammation could be due to certain drugs or the cause could be physiological. You may get some immature cells along with it. Uh, then you add the term RNL with left shift. All right, we use the term leukamoid reaction whenever the leukocyte count exceeds 50 into 10 to the power nine per liter. And these, this, is, uh, this holds true for the uh, granulocytic proliferation okay? with an increase in early neutrophil precursors having a left shift. Uh, the term leukamoid reaction is used because they look like a leukemia, which is an increased proliferation of white cells malignant proliferation of white cells, but in actuality, they are caused due to underlying infection. Then we have leukoetroblastic picture, and the name is self-explanatory. You get left shift of the granulocytic precursors. You may get a few blast cells as well, along with immature nucleated red cells or normoblast and polychromasia. It is not specific for any particular condition, but you may get these uh, LEB or leukoerythroblastic picture in cases of sepsis, bone marrow replacement, any malignant infiltration or early phase of myelofibrosis. Now morphological defects in neutrophil cytoplasm, they are all, most of the time, they are all related to underlying infection. This is a normal neutrophil. Over here, the, there are prominent granules showing toxic granulation, indicating their enhanced activity. A doli body, which is rough endoplasmic reticulum, is also seen in infection. And these vacuoles within the cytoplasm indicate that this neutrophil has degranulated its enzymes uh, due to infection. Then defects in the nuclear segmentation um, could be hypersegmentation seen in infection or megaloblastic anemia, or it could be hyposegmentation or a bilobe neutrophil, which could be most commonly seen in dysplastic conditions like MDS and very rarely in inherited pelger hugh syndrome. Uh, you may be lucky to get these uh, dysmorphic nuclear segmentation uh, so that you can complete your numeric numerics from zero to nine. Coming to lymphocytes, all right. When the lymphocyte count is increased, we use the term lymphocytosis. We have to remember that it is a common phenomenon seen in children because whenever, even if they have a bacterial infection, their lymphocyte count tends to increase. So the age of the, child, of the patient is very important in uh, determining whether it is uh, uh, reactive lymphocytes or whether it is a malignant disease. Uh, you may get uh, increase in the lymphocyte count with mature looking lymphocytes and uh, some reactive lymphocytes. This is commonly seen in uh, CLL or chronic lymphocytic leukemias. Sometimes you get these atypical lymphocytes with prominent nucleoli and these irregularly margined 
uh, cytoplasm, these cells are called uh, atypical lymphocytes and seen commonly in viral infections, namely uh, infectious mononucleosis. Now, over here, there is a comparison. You can see a reactive lymphocyte, which is quite plasma cytoid and uh, atypical lymphocyte. Uh, increased lymphocytosis causes damage to these cells, giving rise to these smudge cell or smear cells. These are the different types of reactive lymphocytes taken from patients suffering from COVID. So nowadays, COVID has become a part of our life and we should be aware of recognizing these different types of reactive lymphocytes seen in different COVID patient slides. All right, you may end up with monocytosis, eosinophilia and basophilia. Actually, I've got a lot of slides, so I'm just hurrying up. All right, CML, a very uh, characteristic findings. In olden golden days, we used to diagnose CML based on the peripheral smear, you know, both CML and CLL. So in CML, uh, you get a high TLC count, a marked left shift, predominantly myelocyte, metamyelocyte, many basophils. These are the basophils and occasional blast. Uh, this is a comparison with CLL. In CML, again, you may have the same features minus the basophils, so it could, with dysplasia, so it could be atypical CML or it could be a leukamide reaction. So you, you need to be uh, sure about what you are suggesting because it is important to interpret the slide to help the clinician. Uh, this is a typical slide of a mature condensed nucleus uh, containing lymphocytes and seen in CLL, but it could be, if it is a slide of a child, it could be simple lymphocytosis. All right. Another important differentiation which we all need to make and be sure about is between the different types of blast. Although it is not mandatory to mention the type of blast on the peripheral smear. Just stating the blast is good enough, okay? You do, because this classification is based on bone marrow. However, if you get an ore rod, which is this red sort of uh, uh, rod structure in the cytoplasm, then you are 99% sure that it is a myeloblast with prominent nucleoli and variable clear cytoplasm. On the other hand, if the cytoplasmic content of the blast is low and they have a clear uh, diffuse open nucleus, then uh, and the size of the blast is smaller, then uh, there are chances that it's going to be a lymphoblast. But you should mention the presence of blast so that we uh, it helps the clinician. Now, these are the different varieties of blast, but they are, you know, more helpful if we uh, review the bone marrow, okay? Uh, similarly, different types of myeloblasts, which you may encounter, but just mentioning the type of, that there's presence of blast is good enough. In lymphomas, you may sometimes very rarely get these flower-shaped cells. These are not segmented neutrophils, but these are T lymphoblasts. And some hairy projections, if present, indicate presence of hairy cell leukemia and presence of these plasma cells uh, in the peripheral smear. If the count is more than 25%, confirms the diagnosis of plasma cell leukemia. Just a single slide about the platelets. Always make sure that your thrombocytopenia is not because of platelet clumps. So always have a look at the feather edge and uh, look for these abnormal giant platelets, which may indicate the presence of uh, uh, myelo proliferative neoplasia, mainly essential thrombocythemia or even MDS. Now, a few tips how to be a good morphologist. 
please participate in external quality assurance program where, where they provide you with different slides so that you can you know uh, hone your skills for identification if not at least participate in morphology sessions at the national or regional level as bsh is regularly conducting these sessions in different centers uh, make a teaching box of interesting slides for your own use as well as for you for the juniors to help them learn and review keep on reviewing slides don't think that this is not your job anymore because uh, you know practice makes a man or a woman perfect thank you thank you so much dr naila for your very informative talk uh, regarding morphology of peripheral blood. Now moving to our last speaker, Karen. She's the technical specialist, uh, special coagulation with the Hamilton Regional Lab Medicine Program, an associate professor, division of hematology and thromboembolism in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. She holds an undergraduate degree in education, specializing in adult education from Brooks University, as well as Master's of Science, Health Research Methodology from McMaster University. She also holds an Advanced Registered Technology Certification in Hematology and a Distinguished Fellowship with Canadian Society of Medical Lab Science. She currently holds the Office of Vice President Member uh, Engagement with International Society for Lab Medicine. And she's an author of over 160 publications and has been invited as guest speaker uh, at multiple conferences. So uh, she will be talking about the role of the coagulation laboratory. So over to you, Ken. Thank you very much. Um, I've been enjoying the presentation so far this uh, week, so or this morning. So it's uh, extremely early here. It's only 8, 10 in the morning here. So uh, bear with me. Um, so it's been a very early, and I'm so happy to be invited. Um, so I have no disclosures, I have no financial relationships, and will not be talking about any off-label use um, of products in this presentation. Just to give you an idea of where I'm sitting, uh, I am from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. So we are at the western end of Lake Ontario. Um, and I'm, again, very pleased, uh, and I do thank the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, so what are the objectives of today's talk is I'm going to discuss the role of the laboratory in the investigation of congenital and acquired um, coagulopathies. Uh, and this is going to be done through case study presentations. And we'll discuss possible causes of the coagulopathy based on the laboratory test results. So what is the role of the laboratory? Uh, in 2020, our national uh, society, the Canadian Society of Medical Laboratory Science, um, launched a national awareness, awareness campaign. And the goal of this campaign was really to profile the contributions of lab professionals uh, within the healthcare system, especially during this pandemic where we know the laboratory is playing a key role, often in the shadows um, of the important work that the uh, uh, frontline workers are doing, but the lab is playing a key role within this pandemic and our national society decided that it was time to promote that. Interestingly, the lab coat was the messenger and you can see uh, the sort of indigo colored lab coat there on the bottom right. And what was really neat about this uh, initiative is that um, they actually in microscopic type listed the names of the 1.2 million lab tests that are performed each day across Canada. And they use the color indigo because it represents confidence, intelligence, ambition, and devotion. And I would suggest that that is characteristic of all lab technologists and lab professionals uh, around the globe, not just Canadian. So we'll jump into some cases. So a sample was received on a 37 year old female inpatient. And the initial workup is listed below. All the tables are formatted the same with the name of the test on the far left, patient results in the middle, and then the appropriate reference interval um, is on the far right. So uh, in this scenario, you can see that uh, 
the INR and the PT in seconds are elevated above our reference interval, as is the PTT. So we have both a PT and a PTT abnormality. So if we think about what could cause an elevated PT INR, and on the left-hand side of this chart, I've listed some possible causes when the PTT is normal. And then on the right, um, what could be some possible causes of when both the PT and the PTT are elevated. And basically when only the INR is elevated, we are looking at a isolated factor seven deficiency. And this could be congenital or acquired. And acquired conditions include early warfarin therapy, early vitamin K deficiency, um, or early liver disease, because we are only looking at factor seven. When both of the tests are abnormal, you can see that basically we're going fishing. Um, so we are going fishing because there's many different reasons why um, we have a coagulopathy involving both of those tests. And that could include therapeutic warfarin, uh, vitamin K deficiency, remembering that warfarin and vitamin K deficiency from the lab perspective is going to result in the same results. However, from a clinical perspective, the cause of that abnormality is definitely going to be different. Um, is it drug induced or is it sort of diet or absorption issues? You know, liver disease, because all of our factors are made in the liver. Um, if we have an abnormality in the common pathway, specifically factor 10, 5, or prothrombin, again, um, because both your PT and your PTT feed into that common pathway. And then, of course, we have our DIC pictures, our dilutional coagulopathies, the presence of an anticoagulant. Um, and most one thing to recognize, and we'll talk about it more in another case, is a fibrinogen disorder to be picked up in the PT and PTT needs to be actually very severe in order to cause abnormality of our PT and our PTT. So in this case, because both the PT and the PTT are abnormal, uh, factor assays were done. And just as a reminder, the principle of a factor assay, it is the degree of correction of the prothrombin time or the activated partial thromboplastin time, PTT, after a dilution of the patient's plasma is mixed one to one with a specific factor deficient plasma. So basically it is a glorified one to one mix where we uh, are able to isolate to a single factor. So PT based factors are measured um, for factor two, five, seven, and 10. And we use a PTT based factor for factor eight, nine, 11, and 12, as well as our other contact factors, precalipine and high molecular weight kininogen. We then take that time in seconds after that one-to-one -one mix, and we actually compare that to a calibration curve. So on our x-axis, we have our known concentration of factor, and we had an excellent presentation and summary by Dr. DeLaSalle on how that calibrator that we're using in our, in our laboratories does need to be referenced back to an international standard, whether that be for the CBC parameter, a chemistry test, a coagulation test, we do need to have traceability back to a validated reference interval or reference calibrator, my apologies. So on our x-axis, we do have our known concentration. On our y-axis, we have the appropriate time in seconds. And then uh, either manually, if we happen to be doing them manually, and I'm a pretty old technologist, so I do remember doing factor assays manually. Um, and then we just uh, plot those times in seconds corresponding to the uh, concentration and we're able to get a calibration curve. We read the patient off of the y-axis and then we can correlate that to a unit per ml activity level. So in this case, all of the factor levels were run because both the PT and the PTT were abnormal. And in this case, the ordering clinician decided to run all of the factors 
And as you can see, the results are here. Again, reference interval is the lower limit of our reference interval is 0.5 units per ml, um, which is 50%. So you can see that we have multiple factors that are below the reference interval with the only exceptions being factor eight and factor nine, which again is, um, is on the lower side, but it is normal. So this is uh, went out with a reduction in the levels of multiple factors, suggesting a coagulopathy of liver disease because there are multiple factors that are down. Um, it is not surprising to have a high factor eight when somebody is ill because we know that factor eight is an acute phase reactant. Um, and therefore, when we are stressed or extreme exercise or uh, very sick, often our factor eight will go very high um, as our body tries to adjust to that abnormality. So often uh, we will run all factor assays. However, there are um, approaches available that limits the number of factors um, that allow us to differentiate acquired coagulopathies. So this chart um, is a summation of various where we could limit to three factors. Um, and in a perfect world and the patient following the textbook, um, which we know doesn't always happen in, in lab medicine. Um, however, if a patient decides to follow the, the textbook, we can actually use these three factors to differentiate between vitamin K deficiency, a coagulopathy of liver disease, or a consumptive coagulopathy. So the, the basic tenet is that uh, we, we use a vitamin K dependent factor. Uh, generally, those are going to be factor two, or factor seven. So we know that factor seven has the shortest half-life and we know that factor two has one of the longest half-lives. So it really doesn't matter which one your lab utilizes. Um, where the differences are is whether you're looking for early vitamin K deficiency or sort of more established or later vitamin K deficiency because factor seven is going to be lower quicker than our factor two is going to be. We then test a non-vitamin K dependent factor that is produced in the liver, and that is going to be factor five. And then we assess factor eight, um, because there's very unique um, scenarios where uh, factor eight would be actually consumed. So in vitamin K deficiency, you just look at those results and, and see what pattern you're coming up with. So in vitamin K deficiency, uh, your liver is working fine, but where the abnormality is, is, is that gamma carboxylation of our vitamin K dependent factors, specifically 2, 7, 9, 10, and protein C and protein S. Um, so when they're being produced, but they cannot, uh, vitamin K is not there to allow that gamma carboxylation step to happen. So they are not functional. So that activity factor level is decreased. Again, liver is working fine, so the level of factor five is going to be normal. And as I've already stated, factor eight is an acute phase reactant, so it will generally be normal to actually being increased uh, depending on the result. Same um, analogies for coagulopathy of a liver disease, both your vitamin K dependent factors and your factor five are going to be low. Again, factor eight is produced in the liver. However, the majority of factor eight is produced outside of the liver. So therefore we do have a normal to increase um, factor eight level as well. And then in a classical um, uh, DIC, so a, a brain trauma, a ruptured placenta, an obstetrical accident, all three of those factors are going to be down. All right, so it's sort of an approach to look at. Um, for the investigation of various acquired coagulopathies. Okay, the next case that we'll just sort of discuss is uh, a 70-year-old female 
who was referred to a hematology outpatient clinic for the investigation of a possible bleeding disorder. As you can see from her results, both of her PT and PTT are abnormal. Um, her fibrinogen, her close fibrinogen is within our reference interval at 3.6 grams per liter. However, her thrombin clotting time is unclottable. It is extremely long, all right? So we were unable to get a clot based on this. So these are normal panel assays that would be done um, on, on patients referred to our hematologist at, for a possible bleeding disorder. So what are some causes of an elevated thrombin clotting time? Well, we know that the, the principle of the thrombin clotting time is where we are timing the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin by adding an exogenous source of thrombin. So we're not relying on the patient's ability to generate thrombin. We're just, we're actually adding that as our test reagent. So obviously if the patient has a quantity issue of fibrinogen, the main zymogen that we're looking at, then we're going to have an elevated thrombin clotting time. In addition, if the fibrinogen that level or the fibrinogen that the liver is producing is not normal, we call that a dysfibrinogenemia. So points number one and two are actually involving the fibrinogen component. So our zymogen that we're trying to assess. It's either not being produced or it's being produced, but it's not working properly. So thrombin cannot cleave fibrinogen peptide A or fibrinogen peptide B off of that fibrinogen molecule to convert it to a monomer normally. The third point that could cause an elevated thrombin clotting time is if the patient is on something that is a direct thrombin inhibitor. So that could be unfractionated heparin, or it could be a direct thrombin inhibitor, um, such as bivalorudin, argatraban, dabigatran. Um, so if they're on an actual direct thrombin inhibitor, of course, um, now they're on a drug which is going to neutralize or uh, take out our reagent. So therefore, there's nothing wrong with the fibrinogen level or function. However, the reagent isn't there, so our thrombin time is going to be up. The last point, number four, is, is doing with the uh, interference with the polymerization of those fibrin monomers that are generated. So in the first step, uh, thrombin has to cleave fibrinogen peptide A and fibrinogen peptide B from the fibrinogen molecule, and, then, and that generates fibrin monomers. Those monomers then need or then immediately polymerize and they are held together by hydrogen bonds. So they just hold. That is what we, that is tangible fibrin. That is what we call um, soluble fibrin or an older term is non-cross-linked fibrin. So that fibrin um, is tangible. It will stop a patient's two socket from, from uh, bleeding. But what has to happen to allow for wound healing is that that soluble fibrin needs to be cross-linked by factor 13, by activated factor 13, and, and then it becomes a insoluble clot or cross-linked clot. So if during that initial polymerization stage of the monomers, if there's anything in the way of those monomers, there's nothing wrong with the hydrogen bonding. However, what happens is that um, the monomers just can't get close enough. So that could be due to the presence of a pair of protein. So the patient has an MGUS or they have Waldenstrom's or a multiple myeloma um, situation going on or if they are, have um, increased fibrin degradation products or an elevated D-dimer. Again, those monomers are struggling just to get close enough to polymerize, all right? So uh, there's nothing wrong. Once they get close enough, the hydrogen bonds are able to, to hold them together, but they, um, 
but it just struggles. So that sometimes our Thraman time will be elevated because of that. So because this was a workup for a bleeding disorder, um, we automatically in our laboratory will run a von Willebrand factor workup. And you can see that in this uh, patient's um, results, it does not appear that she has vitamin uh, von Willebrand's disease um, because all of the results are normal. But what was interesting that the MLT noted in this patient is that as he was um, running the factor eight, we do a minimum of three dilutions as per CLSI and published recommendations. And what he, he noted um, on this patient was that as he increased the dilutions that he ran, the patient's factor activity increased. So um, he was relatively new in our lab and, and he um, rightly so um, questioned this. It was his first exposure to what we call dilutional effect or non-parallelism in a factor assay. So, you know, kudos to him because he actually picked this up immediately. And so from a learning perspective, what he decided to do was to run all the dilutions we have available. And you can clearly see that as he increased dilutions, this lady's factor eight level increased. So what does, what is non-parallelism? This is a screenshot um, from the CLSI document on factor assays that came out in 2016. And I do commend um, this document to you. Um, and in this, it's a nice picture that again, um, by numerics shows you that as the dilution of this sample increases, the factor recovery increases, all right? So, um, and this is pictorially depicted on this software. Not every instrument provides the non-parallelism graphs. However, this particular instrument does. So just to orientate you, the solid line is the standard curve for this factor assay. The small dotted line demonstrates parallelism. So that is what you would expect when you do multiple dilutions on a single sample, you recover the same factor activity. Um, and because it is aligning, it is parallel to the standard curve for the assay. The long dash line is the patient. And you can see that it crosses the standard curve and is not running parallel. So this is called non-parallelism and um, is indicative that there is uh, an interfering substance in the sample um, that could be causing this. So um, often as excellent uh, summation again by Dr. De La Salle on, on the various components um, of pre-analytical, pre-pre-analytical and pre-analytical considerations, um, often non-parallelism is the result of the presence of an anticoagulant. So that could be, again, unfractionated heparin. It could be um, a direct oral anticoagulant, such as rivaroxaban, apixaban. It could be um, a direct thrombin inhibitor. Um, but what we have is an anticoagulant that as we increase the dilution to the patient's plasma, we dilute out the influence, thereby recovering more activity. This could also be the due to a non-specific inhibitor or lupus anticoagulant. Again, we are diluting out the interfering inhibitor um, as and therefore recovering more. Less commonly, um, it could be the presence of a high titer specific inhibitor against another factor. And um, it kind of outside of the scope of today's talk, but we can, we often will uh, see crossover of say a factor eight inhibitor in our factor nine assay because the inhibitor is so high titer. All right, so there, again, the main thing is as technologists, we need to recognize um, this dilutional effect or non-parallelism, and we need to bring it to the attention of our head or our medical director, whoever signs out on these reports for your lab, so that um, they can uh, comment 
um, on that and or contact the uh, consulting physician. So in this case, because again, uh, it's a unique scenario because of the investigation we do in our laboratory, the patient had provided the lab with a drug history. And it, we found out after the fact that the patient actually was on the bigotran, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor. So this dilutional effect was um, a pre-analytical consideration um, due to the anticoagulant the patient was receiving. All right, the next case is a 45-year-old uh, referred in sample from out of province. So our laboratory in Hamilton at McMaster University um, is a referral lab. Our, men, our test menu is quite extensive. And uh, so we often receive about 75% of our work is referred in from either uh, within um, our community, um, within our province, but we also receive uh, samples from across Canada and to a much lesser degree from the US. Um, but we do receive out of province samples quite frequently um, because our test menu allows um, for further investigation. So in this case, this was a, a sample received from a 45 year old female um, specifically for a fibrinogen workup. So what we started with is that we ran a thrombin clotting time because we've, as we've already mentioned, the thrombin clotting time um, is a specific test that just times fibrinogen to fibrin. So it's very um, influenced by the fibrinogen um, only in the patient sample. And we ran a Klaus fibrinogen, which is a functional thrombin based fibrinogen assay, um, which will look at uh, the um, function of the amount of fibrinogen. And as you can see, the thrombin clotting time is prolonged and the close fibrinogen is quite low. It is at 0.8 grams per liter, which is well below the lower limit of our reference interval of 1.6 grams per liter. So again, just to remind you that an elevated thrombin clotting time is influenced by the fibrinogen and those could be either a quantity issue or a quality issue. So it's very important that we um, offer the clinicians a differentiation um, between a hypo or a dis. Um, and so we do that in our lab by offering a fibrinogen antigen level. So we're actually looking at the production and we do a reptilase time. So these are on the left hand side is sort of the immunological uh, fibrinogen or fibrinogen antigen assay. Um, we run it uh, currently by a latex immunoagglutination or immunoturbometric method. This can also be done uh, electrophoretically by Laurel rocket technique. Um, and uh, where we just add the antibody to human fibrinogen to the agar plate. And once everything is solidified, we actually electrophoresis the um, plasma, causes antigen antibody reactions, and we actually stain that electrophoretic gel, and we're actually able to determine the antigen level. Uh, more, more um, depending on the instrumentation that your laboratory has, the latex immunoagglutination obviously lowers CV, um, easier, uh, more techs can run it. Um, a little bit, uh, you know, but certainly isn't a cheap method. But basically what happens any latex immunoagglutination assay is we have a specific antibody bound to a latex bead. Um, then we add the plasma sample. And if the antigen, in this case fibrinogen, um, is in the plasma, it binds to the fibrinogen antibody on the latex and, uh, bead and causes agglutination. And our analyzer assesses that change in absorbance. So therefore we have a very cloudy solution. As agglutination happens, we have less cloud or less turbidity. And therefore that change in agglutination is directly proportional to the fibrinogen concentration. So that is a production 
method. Um, the reptilase time is a snake venom um, from the Bothrop Atrox, and I probably just killed the name of that snake, but that's okay. Um, anyways, but basically what this snake venom does is it releases the fibrinogen peptide A from the fibrinogen molecule and allows fibrin to form, okay? And it is a time in seconds. So it's, it's similar to a thrombin clotting time, except we're using the snake venom reptilase and, and causing a clot time to happen. So what, um, this is a paper from 2008 that uh, Verhozik et al. published, and I do recommend this paper to you as a good summary. Um, it's, a, it's a very test of the month in the American Journal, um, American Journal. And uh, it has this table, which really gives you a short and sweet summation of what the various tests will do um, for looking up fibrinogen abnormalities. So if we think about the prothrombin time and the PTT or the PT and the PTT, they are have very poor sensitivity to mild deficiencies of fibrinogen. So often the PT and PTT will be normal, yet the patient has a fibrinogen abnormality going on. The thrombin clotting time, as we've already alluded to, has very poor specificity to fibrinogen disorder because there's many other reasons or interferences that could influence that time. So again, it's poor specificity. Uh, the reptilase time, again, similar to the thrombin clotting time, is um, influenced um, by FBPs or paraproteins. Um, so again, has, has um, better specificity to a fibrinogen disorder, but doesn't pick them all up because if the patient has an FPB mutation, um, you know, the reptilase actually is helpful, but is not specific. Uh, as discussed, the, uh, the close fibrinogen is a functional assay and the antigen is important because it is a quantitative um, assessment of the fibrinogen level. So it's all of these tests put together which allow for um, proper uh, fibrinogen workup. So in this case, what we have, um, what is noteworthy when you're putting these into place in your laboratory is it's important to ensure that a normal pooled plasma or a normal plasma is run at the same fibrinogen level as the patient's functional fibrinogen. So in this case, the patient's functional fibrinogen or close fibrinogen was 0.8 grams per liter. So therefore, we actually diluted normal plasma to 0.8 so that when your head or, or medical director is interpreting these results, they can look at what a normal time is at the same fibrinogen level and be able to interpret correctly whether they think that this prolongation of the patient's plasma is actually due to a dysfibrinogenemia or is it just because it's a low fibrinogen. So what our lab has in place are in vitro spikes. So we all know that in vitro spikes are not mirror images of a patient's um, plasma. However, it does provide some guidance on what you expect a particular test to react or, or respond depending on the condition. So this is a fibrinogen sensitivity curve on our X axis. We have a decreasing, or depending on how you look at it, increasing concentrations of fibrinogen on the, y-axis, we have our thrombin clotting times. And then um, what we've highlighted is the relevant reference intervals. So the upper limit of thrombin clotting time is 30 seconds in our lab. The lower limit of fibrinogen is 1.6. So you can see that our thrombin clotting time starts to go abnormal or will be abnormal by about 1.2 grams per liter um, thereabouts. So it provides some guidance. So I do recommend in vitro sensitivity curves um, as a resource for your um, medical director head of section 
in order to correctly interpret. So we know that at 0.8 grams per liter, the thrum and clotting time will run around 40 seconds in our, in our lab. However, the patient's thrum and clotting time is running at 51 seconds, okay? So, and interestingly, so from the graph, we were around 40 seconds. When we actually run a plasma, it ran at 35 seconds. That's, that's pretty good um, correlation. Um, so in this scenario, it went out as a possible dysfibrinogenemia because we have this discrepancy between production of fibrinogen and its function. All right, so that is a classic dysfibrinogenemia where you see a discrepancy between production and function. All right, so production is higher than function. And then um, that, so it was uh, an interesting, so this actually went out as a possible dysfibrinogenemia. Again, because none of these tests are specific um, for only a dys, um, our head of section actually also suggested that it could be um, hyperfibrinogenolysis causing it. So again, um, the clinical picture needs to be considered. The last case that I'm going to talk about is um, the sample uh, that was received on a 71-year-old male, again, from an outside laboratory um, for an investigation of an elevated PT and PTT. So the first thing we do when we get these referred in samples is that we do um, repeat the core tests um, because we understand our reagent instrument combinations. So you can see that clearly there is significant abnormality um, in the PT and the PTT. However, the fibrinogen um, level is, is normal, um, as is depicted by the thrum and clotting time. So we know that there is not an anticoagulant, a thrombin generated anticoagulant, or a low fibrinogen that is um, causing this abnormality. So as a reminder, when both the PT and the PTT are elevated, there are many different causes that this could be, but in a perfect world, what we're looking for is, is there a factor deficiency in the common pathway? Could factor 10, five or two be low in order as the cause of this abnormality? And as you can see in this scenario, the factor five, was undetectable and went out as less than 1% or less than 0 0.01 units per ml. So the, the question that gets risen at this point is, is this a congenital factor five, severe factor five deficiency, or is it an acquired deficiency? And if it's an acquired deficiency, then we need to look for an inhibitor to this factor five. So incubated one-to-one -one mixing, I know that is getting late, so um, I will not spend a lot of time on the next few slides, but I am happy to, um, you know, discuss this with anybody um, after the fact if, if uh, the organizers want to provide my email. So basically, um, a screening test that can happen is what we call an incubated one-to-one -one mixing study, and this can be done for either a PTT elevation or a PT elevation, but basically we set up a variety of tubes mixed with normal pooled plasma. And after specific time frames, we repeat either the PTT or the PT. This example is of the PTT, where we have on the original PTT, a very prolonged PTT. On the immediate one-to-one -one mix, we will see full correction because if there's a factor deficiency, we've repeated place the factor by the normal pool of plasma. So we're into the normal range. But then over incubated time at 37 degrees, what we see is an increase in the PTT where eventually after two hours, we're back up to where we originally started. All right. And that is suggesting 
the presence of a specific inhibitor. So by definition, um, specific inhibitors are time and temperature dependent. So we have the incubated mixing studies, which is a screening test for inhibitor assays. Um, and often are used in labs that don't have access to a Bethesda unit titer um, or specific factor activities. So in this case, we're looking for factor five inhibitor. All the Bethesda unit and the Nymengen modifications were developed for factor eight inhibitors. So we just utilize that same method. We just um, modify it slightly. So basically, again, there, it's a series of incubated one-to-one -one mixes with normal pooled plasma. If there is an antibody present in the patient's plasma, it will over time in, um, inhibit the, 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 the factor in the normal pooled plasma. And thereby, we recover less factor after two hours at 37 degrees. We calculate that what is called percent residual factor activity after two hours, and we compare that to a Bethesda unit graph. And we are actually able to tighter out the strength of that specific inhibitor. So this is a, a strength, so um, basically a high titer Inhibitor is greater than five Bethesda units. Um, less than that is considered low titer, still significant, but low titer. Um, and as you can see in this uh, case with the less than 1% factor five, this patient actually had a 145 Bethesda unit factor five inhibitor, um, which um, was causing those significant abnormalities in the PT and the PTP because of the common pathway. And I thank you for your attention. And I know the, 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 the session was running late, so I do uh, appreciate you holding out. Thank you so much, Karen, for these uh, very interesting and very informative uh, cases that you discussed. Uh, I think we all learned a lot from them. And now this was all for the presentations and talks for today. Now coming to our panelists, Dr. Bushra Moiz and Dr. Shibni Sassan for uh, the question and answer and uh, uh, discussion panel. Good evening. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity. And it was really nice uh, listening to all the talks, especially the young technologists who presented initially about the ABU discrepancy and ABU titer. They were, they were very good uh, you know, scientific papers that were initially presented. Uh, to start the discussion, I have one question from uh, Ms. Barbara and then another from Ms. Karen, uh, just to start the discussion. So my first question is uh, for Ms. Barbara that, uh, we have uh, instruments uh, of coagulation which are used outside the laboratory, like for example, the PRP procurement instrument is lying in the in the in the dermatology and in, in the OR, and then we have uh, various instruments like thromboelastogram and ACT which are being used in uh, cardiac uh, uh, and cardiac services and also in the trauma services. So my question is how the laboratory uh, provides a quality assurance of these instruments which are outside the laboratory and which are not even connected to our system for any QC monitoring. So Ms. Barbara, can you elaborate more on this? Uh, sorry, Dr. Bushra, but uh, uh, Dr. Barbara actually excused. She had uh, to go into a meeting. So uh, she's not with us for the uh, question and answers. So yeah. and, okay. Uh, I don't mean to jump in, but um, I, I'm happy to answer that from a Canadian Ontario perspective because uh, I was, I am the former chair of our provincial quality assurance um, IQMH committees. Basically, with point, we call those point of care testing, of course, um, and that is, as you've already alluded to, the responsibility of the laboratory. So, um, what we have in the HRLMP and what is a laboratory accreditation. Um, in Ontario is that you need to have a department, if you will, 
uh, that monitors the performance of that, that documents quality control, documents users. Um, and it's literally a, a extra function, an extra department that does need to work with the nurses or doctors or, or ECG people. Um, now, ECG is not part of the lab, but at least not in Ontario. However, um, for blood glucose, um, for all of those things that you've listed, they've, um, they do need to be monitored by the lab and we actually have to um, have all that documentation in place. So it's just a, a system that you have to put in place um, and it is challenging. Um, quite honestly, it's always the one that labs get uh, cited on the most because it is a very challenging and diverse community that you're working with, but it is, it is just something that the lab has to manage. I hope that was some help. I'm sure Dr. De La Salle could give you a much better answer, but that's my perspective. Thank you so much. So uh, some of the instruments which are which can be connected to the to our system, for example, glucose, et cetera, they are on the POCT. The POCT committee looks after that and they are there on the system, but then, then there are other instruments which are not, which are done, for example, which are the instruments where you perform the test manually, for example, ICT malaria, and then the hemoglobin, which is done in the, uh, in the um, blood bank for the donors, things like that, they are not on the, so that's why, that's why I was wondering how to control these things. So thank you so much for yeah. that. It's I a manual, an... it's a manual man, um, resource heavy, but it has to be done. Thank you so much. So I, I have a question from you or regarding the inhibitors which we're talking about. So in one of our CAP surveys, we found that uh, we miss inhibitors um, and we couldn't fi find them. So my question is, uh, we when uh, when whenever a PTT or PT is prolonged, we do mixing studies in one is to one ratio. So do you recommend that we should uh, do it Together with that, we should do it in one is to four proportion as well to find out low dose inhibitors, or should we just do 50-50 plasma uh, studies? And uh, what what are your views about that? Um, okay, so so for an elevated P to your PTT, um, realistically, we we have to both we both recognize we all recognize that this is not a validated test. This is kind of just something that you know over time. Um, clinicians and lab have come up with this, hey, look, this result is good. So um, that has, from a PT and PTT perspective, has always remained a one-to-one. -one. I don't know um, of any lab um, or, or, or procedure that suggests we do a one in four for that. Where I have seen one in fours used is in the investigation of a lupus anticoagulant or a non-specific inhibitor. Um, however, I believe um, the ISTH scientific subcommittee on, on lupus anticoagulant um, recently updated their, their LA investigations. And one to four is, if I'm remembering the guideline that came out in November correctly, is not recommended um, because it is just, and again, um, I, I'll remember being at SSC one a couple of years ago and Dr. Um, DeGroote, I believe, was just saying, if you have to look that hard for a lupus anticoagulant, it's not there. It's not clinically significant. So um, I believe the SSC is maintaining a one-to-one -one, um, part of that investigation. So I, we in our lab do not ever do a one-to-four under really any circumstances. I hope that helps. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So these, these were my two questions from, uh, from the experts. Uh, maybe Shabniz, uh, Dr. Shabniz, do you want to ask questions? Yes, I um, do have a question um, and uh, I think anybody can answer it. Of course, Dr. Barbara has left, so I would rather direct my question to Dr. Hassan. So as far, because it's a developing country that we are living in, so I was uh, just, of, uh, I just had a comment actually that uh, an observation in our country, not all the labs are uh, going for external quality assurance because not everybody can afford it. And very few labs uh, are actually going for cap surveys and whatever external quality assurance they can afford. But considering that there are many laboratories out there who are practicing reporting results and many people are getting their tests done outside. So would you, how much weightage would you give to those laboratories who are not going for external quality assurance? 
So in your opinion, are there tests as reliable as uh, those laboratories who are actually going for experimental qualifications? Is that important? And if it is important, are there any other ways in which these labs can also participate in external qualifications programs? Uh, I want to answer this. Uh, as I told in my presentation that uh, the, the quality management system is an ongoing procedure and there is always a room for improvement. So for the labs uh, which cannot afford the, uh, the expensive external accreditation and the uh, professional testing surveys, uh, they, can, uh, they can do uh, at least the, uh, the, the daily quality control checks and they, they can also uh, participate in other uh, available surveys, for example, uh, from the some surveys from UK like NICAS. And they also uh, send sample to the neighboring labs in uh, in the city or country to get their result uh, reject. Uh, so there are these are some ways of, uh, through which they can uh, achieve a certain level in uh, quality. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hassan. Uh, Karen, would you have any comment regarding this? Are there any uh, laboratories outside uh, Pakistan who want to uh, send, uh, send the laboratories over here, wish to participate in external quality assurance? Are there any labs who would want to help the, uh, the laboratories here in some way? Um, I, I think that there always will be. I think that split sample testing is an important um, thing. Again, one thing that we have to recognize is there's going to be cost associated um, with that. And I can tell you that split sample um, testing, I mean, our laboratory does a C1 inhibitor assay that does, but we use a plasma-based assay, which is not available in any external proficiency testing program that we can find. So we actually do do split testing with another lab, um, actually three other labs, um, Two of them are in BC and one of them's in Alberta. So, so we do, um, as suggested, we do do that split sample. It's not within our city, but it's within our country. Um, so there is, and we do those um, twice a year. So, and we split the cost. So, you know, so realistically, uh, the HRLMP will only be on the hook once every two years in order to, to sort of have the cost of the couriers and stuff. So I would encourage um, as suggested, even within uh, your own country, you could, as long as you can find a lab doing the same assay, um, commit to that. And I mean, we have four labs. We do it twice a year. So literally, it's only costing once every two years. So significant decreasing um, costs um, as opposed to, to external proficiency, which I agree 100% can be extremely expensive um, and, and add up very quickly. So completely concur with those uh, justifiable concerns. But split sample will work, and the more labs you have, the less cost it will be um, per lab, per send out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a good idea to spread the samples and uh, uh, in order to be cost effective, especially. And one thing which I have a suggestion that, uh, like, for example, this Pakistan from the, I'm saying this from the platform of Pakistan Society of Hematology, that we, uh, the labs which can, uh, the labs which are the bigger labs of the country, they should be able to make some mechanism of providing the QC materials to the various labs and providing the, uh, you know, providing the samples and looking at the results at the uh, local level so that, uh, the, those labs which, uh, and this should be all on the voluntary basis. For, so the labs which cannot afford the QC, can, then perhaps they can be um, even uh, looked at the quality, uh, which should be confidential, obviously, that the, the results can be provided to them, to these labs and their, their um, uh, what should I say, their uh, competencies and their uh, efficiencies can be monitored through some local mechanisms. And I think it's it's a hard uh, time that we should start thinking in that direction to provide the QC uh, some, uh, you know, um, uh, oversight on, of the, on the QC of the various labs which are run, running in the country. This is important from the quality care point of view for the patients to provide the quality to high quality care to the patients. And I, and I agree 100% with everything you said. The, the only one additional comment I would make is when you set this up, because I think it's an excellent um, initiative, 
you do need to set your uh, acceptable criteria a priori. So you need to have that right set up right right at the front um, so that, and, and, a, and hopefully a plan that if you have discrepancy, what are you going to do about it? All right. So, you know, um, what, what are some steps, some, some um, high level steps that, that you do expect those labs to go through so that there's guidance right from the get go. Um, and, and it's not just saying that lab B is, is, is way out from lab A and C, but they just have the attitude, well, they're wrong and I'm right. So, you know, like you need to have a, a plan on, on that in, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. I think we need to do a little brainstorming before starting uh, such such a thing. And it should be an agreed plan for all the laboratories so that whoever wants to participate should exactly know that what is the expectation from that lab and what will be the, uh, and how, how the, the ways in which we can help these labs to get to the quality. So I think there should be a plan for that before initiating that. Right, I also have another question, uh, and I think it's directed to Dr. Naida, if she is here still. So, Dr. Naida, can you are you can you hear me? First of all, I think uh, anybody can answer. So, I think uh, there are a lot of machines which are coming up. Automation is now a game changer for uh, hematology. So, in automation, morphology is now being replaced by automated uh, instruments, which is giving flaggings and uh, a lot of signals uh, regarding the morphology of the peripheral smear. And a lot of labs who can actually afford uh, going to the automated automation, they are now thinking about, I mean, they are now moving forward. For um, how important is it uh, for a developing setup? to go towards automation. For example, if there's a lab, it, it, it can't afford automation. Is it important for it to switch uh, regarding morphology, to switch from uh, manual uh, smear, uh, uh, peripheral smear review to automated uh, peripheral smear review? Is it, can it be done? And is it important? Is it priority? So Dr. Bushra, if you don't mind, if you can just give me your comments regarding this. Uh, Shabni, sorry, I, I couldn't hear your question because the voice was breaking. So can you please repeat your question? Yes. So there are a lot of instruments. Uh, we actually do morphology through microscopy, right? But there are a lot of automation, automated instruments which are now replacing uh, gradually or maybe now maybe at a rapid pace. It's replacing uh, manual smear review. So how important? Because uh, tertiary care hospitals and those who can actually afford, they are going towards that setup. How important is, is it for a developing setup to use automation as a, as a way forward regarding peripheral morphology? Regarding morphology. Yeah, so Shabniz, I got your question. I think it all depends upon the test volumes you are having for your patients. So if you are a, if you are a low output uh, um, uh, laboratory with like having uh, 25 to 50 samples a day and you are like having a microscopist who is uh, very good in, the, in morphology then perhaps you don't need automation uh, for like uh, the various digital morphology instruments which are now available you don't need them but if you are a high output laboratory for example you have 3,000 to 5,000 samples a day and 70% of them, if you think that they, they require a morphological review as given by the instrument, then perhaps that makes a point for um, uh, digital morphology. But again, that also requires a microscopist to, or morphologist to, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, sign out those reports that cannot go out by themselves on oh. the instrument. Well, it may decrease the time, but even then some, Papers which have come out have shown that they actually, the time that were taken by an expert morphologist was equal to the time taken by the instrument for the morphology because it needs to be again parallelly checked by a morphologist to be signed out. And then 20% of those will remain for the morphologist to confirm because instrument will be confused between the blast and atypical lymphocytes. It may not be able to pick up the malarial parasites and so on. So I think it all depends upon your uh, volume load which you are to 
go for that. And I, I think a very good morphologist, which I think is um, cannot be replaced. And if that is, because now we are talking about um, artificial intelligence and replacing uh, human resources uh, from the laboratory, but I think these people who are expert in morphology, they will still be needed in the lab. And I don't see in, in near future, they are getting replaced by the machine learning or AI. That's what my understanding is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so, here, so if you have any questions from uh, the audience, so can you check? Do you have any questions for this? No, so no, so we don't have any questions from the uh, virtual attendees or the uh, participants. So I think uh, now we have reached towards the end of today's session. If uh, anybody else wants to comment on anything, they can. Or otherwise, I think we will end the session here. And uh, thank you so much to all the virtual attendees, to all the participants, our speakers, and esteemed uh, panelists for being part of this session today. I think we all learned a lot. And there were some very interesting presentations and cases and uh, suggestions as well at the end. And uh, thank you so much uh, for being part of this and uh, making it very interesting and informative. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.